Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sumaya al -Majdub. I'm a Middle East Fellow here at Young Professionals in Foreign Policy in Washington, DC. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Our event is live streamed on Facebook. If you are joining us online, please share your questions and comments on the Facebook live stream or on Twitter um, at YPFP. Uh, before we begin our discussion, I have a quick message from our YPFP uh, team. Um, in light of the tragic earthquake that happened uh, very recently in Western Iran and Iraq, we want to take a moment to note that while relations between Iran and the United States are very tense, um, a number of international NGOs are pursuing relief efforts um, and helping provide relief to civilians. So we encourage, you, we encourage you to follow up on those developments and support them if you can. So today's dis discussion is a very timely and critical one. As you all know, on October 13th, President Trump uh, decertified the uh, JCPOA, or the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So our objective from tonight's discussion is to share some of the thinking around the Iran nuclear deal, discuss U.S. national security interests, and look at the different approaches that the U.S. can take when dealing with Iran, especially when it comes to issues as, such as Iran's destabilizing activities in the region. To give you an outline of our discussion today, each speaker will present their introductory remarks. Um, after that, we will turn to the audience. We'll take your questions. We'll try and take some questions from social media as well. So we have with us today, in order um, from my left and your right, we have Ambassador Lincoln Bloomfield, who is the chairman of the Stimson Center in Washington, DC. He was previously a presidential special envoy from 2008 till 2009, leading US efforts to protect international aviation from anti-craft missiles. Ambassador Bloomfield served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Political Military Affairs from 2001 till 2005. He was also the president's special representative on the landmine issue and led US government international outreach on critical issues, including cybersecurity. We also have with us Dr. Richard Birchall, who is the Director of Research and Engagement at Trends. Um, he was previously a member of the Wilberforce Institute for the Study of Slavery and Emancipation and reader in law school at the University of Hull. He's been an expert speaker on a number of issues, including international law, human rights, and counterterrorism for the UN Office on Drugs and Crime and the George C. Marshall Center for Security Studies. We also have with us Natalie Fuchs, who is a senior program analyst and a defense for a defense contractor in space um, and missile in the space and missile sector. She's currently pursuing her master's degree in Georgetown University in security studies, and she's also a fellow with American security, the American Security Project's Women in Security Leadership Initiative. Last but not least, we have Russ Reed, who's a politics journalist and national security analyst. He, uh, his work focuses on Middle Eastern security, and he previously worked as a dep deputy director for a Middle East-focused think tank where he specializes in the in Iran nuclear negotiations. He's also the editor-in-chief of YPFP his own Charged Affairs Journal. Uh, a word of thank you for our partners at Trends Research and Advisory uh, who have partnered with us to host our event today. So I want to turn uh, the mic over to Ambassador Bloomfield and he can share some of his thoughts about, um, you know, we all know that Trump has decertified the deal. Um, what should Congress do? And we're, when we're thinking about US national security interest, um, are we better off with or without the deal or with something else? So um, we're happy to hear from all okay. of you. Thank you very much, Samaya. Good evening, everyone, and hello to anyone who's watching on social media. Um, it's a pleasure not to have uh, a very structured format. Um, I, I'm sitting next to Richard Birchall, who's the director of research at Trends in Abu Dhabi, and also happy to see the chairman and founder of Trends, Dr. Ahmed El Hamli, here. Uh, the only guidance I got is that I had two jobs tonight. One is to be old, <laughs> and the other is to be handsomely upstaged by smarter young professionals. And I, that, I, that's easy. I can do that. So let me just share a few thoughts. Um, watching the campaign last year and the outsider candidate named Donald Trump, I remember the first time he said anything about the Iran deal. Can you remember what he said? One word came out of, they were all standing at their little uh, debate podiums. <clears throat> Mr. Trump said, well, it's a contract. It's the first thing he ever said, it's a contract. And he didn't elaborate on that. Later in the debates, he picked up on what Ted Cruz and the other Republicans were saying, uh, which was they hated the deal, and it was a terrible deal, and it was badly negotiated, et cetera. But remember what the other candidates said. You know, I, Ted Cruz, for all we know, was going to miss the first dance at the inaugural ball because he was going to be so busy sitting back in his Oval Office tearing up the Iran deal. That was his promise, had he been elected. President Trump 
has been in office uh, since January 20th. He has not torn up the Iran deal. In fact, when you say decertify, that's not part of the JCPOA. Mm -hmm. That's not something that the P5 plus one or Iran uh, agreed to or the IAEA. It's something that Congress uh, legislated. Congress wasn't going to legislate anything had the previous administration had their way. They wanted a fait accompli um, and Senator Corker and Senator Cardin, some others, passed legislation to say, no, 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 Congress needs a voice in this. And the administration resisted, and they finally said, all right, you've got 30 days to review it once we're finished, and if it happens during a recess, 60 days. Well, it happened during a recess, the summer of 2015, and so Congress was pretty angry. If you, and those of you who've worked on the Hill, you have friends who work on the Hill, they were angry. I used to go to dinners, and I, hear, I heard the staff members say, we haven't heard a thing about this deal. There's six-month delays. It's gone on for two years. No one has told my senator anything. So they were basically like this. They were in a very defensive position. They were not happy about being handed a, a finished product. Having said that, President Obama was right about a couple of things. Number one, there is no good alternative. In other words, this cake has been baked. You can't unbake the cake. We already gave away the UN resolutions. We gave Iran essentially a legal status after eight to 15 years. They could be a legal nuclear weapons power, something that they weren't before. They had two years plus to sit in the international spotlight with the P5 plus one, which gave tremendous face and legitimacy and status uh, to the Iranian negotiators, which they wanted at that time. They, they had a legitimacy problem. So they got what they wanted. Um, they got their, their cash unfrozen with interest, as you, as you know all these things. So where are we now? I think what President Trump has done is actually fairly clever. He has not backed out of the deal. He's not done it. Why? One reason is that when a president tears up an executive agreement with a foreign country, the next time you want to make a deal, say a new trade deal with Korea or bilateral deals all over Asia, those countries could turn around and say, look, I, why should I make an executive agreement with you? The next president might just tear it up. So you're really tearing up the currency, the coin of the realm of presidential uh, international affairs if you rip up an executive agreement. I, th I hope the people around the president have pointed this up because the next country could well say, I'm not going to sign an executive agreement with the United States. It has to be a treaty. And that gives the Senate the final word on any agreement, which takes essentially the, the authority away from the executive branch. That's a pretty big deal. And it's not something that you've heard talked about. So I think the president has been well advised not to sort of operationalize his negative view of this agreement. Now, on the other side of the ledger, and then I'll stop, there are two strong constituencies whom I respect who have a passionate view about this. One is uh, the Obama administration. They're very proud of their accomplishment. So they, whenever they see criticism, they become defensive, that you're just trying to take away our number one foreign policy accomplishment. The other is... The, the nuclear nonproliferation community. Many of you may be part of that community. People who really know a lot about the history of arms control with the Soviet Union, with uh, different agreements with, with Korea. Uh, and for years, very hardline national security professionals in this town have said, we need to have nuclear restraints on rogue countries or countries of concern. Iran was at the top of the list. They got it. So I know a lot of people, friends of mine who I respect greatly, who are very rigid in saying, don't mess with a nuclear arms control agreement with Iran. We waited 38 years for this deal. Now, there's another side to the story, and I think that, Samaya, you introduced it very well, which is, what about everything else Iran's been doing? They've executed 3,100 people at home since Rouhani took office in 2013. They have 150 to 200,000 fighters under arms commanded by the Quds Force. They are a big problem in Iraq. In Syria, they called in all the airstrikes and barrel bombs that displaced 10 million Syrians, creating a huge humanitarian crisis. Uh, they're guilty of bringing ballistic missile technology into, into the Houthi uh, part of northern Yemen and firing a 700 kilometers into King Khalid Airport just outside of Riyadh the other day. This is dangerous stuff. Um, and so they have Hezbollah, which is 100% Iranian funded. There are a lot of things that Iran is doing, and it, the list of international laws that they break serially have broken since they took over our embassy, for example, is very, very long. And Foreign Minister Zarif is, is, is very talented at making it seem that they're the victim in all this. And that's why he's so successful, and that's why they put him out there. But the truth is much tougher. So I have more to say about this, but I think that what the Congress should do is find a way to sort of challenge everyone to look harder 
uh, at, the, at the possible military dimension sites. There are places where uh, warhead design could be taking place uh, and sort of challenge the international community to say that the, the IAEA scheme and the PM and the JCPOA um, is not airtight and it doesn't give full confidence to professionals, including the former deputy director of IAEA who's up at Harvard, Ali Heinonen, who says, I could never vouch for uh, the fact that all the pathways to the bomb are closed off if I couldn't see what's happening at some of these, uh, these sites with possible military activities. Well, those are closed off. So there are some gaps in the agreement, but I think the U.S. would be on sol more solid ground if they stayed with the Europeans. I don't think that the Russians and Chinese are, are going to be terribly helpful strategically on this. Um, and then found ways uh, to put some pressure on Iran for these other activities. So that would be my formula. Wonderful. Dr. Bertram? Well, I mean, Lincoln made it quite easy. I agree. Uh, moving on. <coughs> uh, no. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming, and thanks to YPFP for this opportunity. Uh, very much looking forward to it. My preliminary remarks are going to be very much in line with Lincoln's, um, but I'm going to come a bit harder from the perspective of international law and international relations. That's my background, but also that's how I look at how we analyze these things. Yes, the JCPOA is a cake that's been baked. We can't be unbaking the cake. So actually, in many respects, yeah, let's keep it because it allows us to have events like this. It allows us to be Iran, to keep Iran in the news every day. What are you doing? Are you adhering to the agreement? Did you get all the information out? Did you let the inspectors in? And so it allows for that continual scrutiny of their activities. That cannot be a bad thing. But that raises all kinds of question marks within the particular regime that's being applied. The IAEA is an international organization. It has its procedures, it has its methods. A lot of its procedures and methods are very secretive for reasons that make sense. States would not sign up to these inspection regimes unless the technology, the developments could be kept confidential. Again, this is, how, this is one of the unfortunate traits of international law. You want states to buy in, you gotta concede things to them. Fine, that's all right. But what the JCPOA did, it brought Iran's nuclear activity into the public forum. Iran can't now not say, can now not say, oh, it's all private, it's all confidential, trust us. No, no, no. You've shown already that you're going to try to go against international law that you signed up to, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. You've been subject to Security Council resolutions. The whole world is looking at you. So now we can continue to look at you. And this is what I would strongly encourage with the IAEA, is them just being a bit clearer on what they're doing, allowing some of their methodology, some of their findings to be subjected to more scientific rigor, because the, essentially the JCPOA is an arms control agreement, so it's very technical, very detailed, very problematic. And some of the criticisms we're seeing from people that appear to be in the know, some aspects are quite worrying. I have no idea about the technical details, I'm not sure if you guys do, but the amount of heavy water, the amount of rich uranium, stuff like that I can't get into but people have question marks about the technical. One of the biggest concerns I've heard recently in having discussions here in DC and in Europe is the time the IAEA is actually spending on inspections. They have a great infographic on their website that we increased our number of inspectors by 20% since the JCPOA. But people say, yeah, they have, they have more inspectors, but they're actually spending less time inside Iran and inside the facilities. They're allowing a lot of self-inspection so the Iranians will just provide them with the information, say, there you go. It will be scrutinized, but they won't go behind the door into the lab to make sure everything is as it says on paper. Now, Iran's own nuclear regulatory um, head last, or late last year said, yeah, we didn't really do things that we were supposed to do and we're not going to. He publicly admitted it. But yet the inspectors have not gone in to confirm or verify what he has said. So, Keep the JCPOA in place, but at the same time, let's use it to ensure rigorous assessments, rigorous evaluations. Let's not just give Iran a free pass on this. And this is one thing I am finding is quite intriguing. People question the president's decertification. Say, well, he certified it the other two times. Yes, but that doesn't mean they can then not adhere to it. So it is possible to go backwards. It doesn't have to be this sort of linear progression to the positive negatives may arise. So let's ask these questions. Now my other perspective that I come to from this is 
more of a sort of academic approach, but I think it helps us to frame some of our arguments. The view in the world today from a normative point of view is that nuclear weapons are not a good thing. Unless somebody wants to argue, no, they're a great thing, let's keep them. The early treaty on nonproliferation said, look, we have nuclear states, fact of life, we have to deal with this. Nobody else can have a nuclear weapon. A number of states have acquired a nuclear weapon, but they weren't signatories to the treaty. Iran is a signatory to the treaty. It has told the entire international community, we will use nuclear power for peaceful uses only. We will not get a weapon. They've already reneged on one promise. They've reneged on one contract already. So can they be trusted again? Well, questionable. Equally, we have within the General Assembly of the United Nations over the last two years, a big push by over 150 states to bring about nuclear disarmament completely. Complete non uh, complete, stop non-proliferation, but disarmament as well. So nuclear weapons are seen as a very bad thing. So for people to say, oh, well, you know, we'll let Iran do it eventually, no. That's going against the normative values of the international system. And so the current nuclear weapon state should be encouraged to disarm. Nuclear energy has to be used as part of development for peaceful uses. So I'm not saying non-nuclear, but the use of nuclear weapons is something that's against the system. So I, I struggle to understand how or why Iran is sort of given a bit of open space to develop a weapon. In the history of the world, every state that has started on the path of nuclear weapons technology has acquired a weapon. South Africa disarmed after creating the weapon, and I know there's question marks over Argentina and Brazil, a conversation we had earlier today on how far down the road they got. So if we believe that Iran is not going to acquire a nuclear weapon, I think we're being delusional because every other state in the world has made sure they got one. How is Iran any different? And just finally, from a European perspective, the whole purpose of the JCPOA was to bring Iran back into the community of nations. It was a confidence building exercise. We're gonna show trust, they show trust back, we all start working together. As Lincoln pointed out quite clearly, that has not happened at all. The violations of international law are massive and continual. The United States, is not constrained by the JCPOA to be nice to Iran. It has its own national security interests that it has to uphold on the ground. It has to take action in this field, and it has international law behind it. States of Europe are in the same position. It seems odd how the JCPOA has become the only evaluator of all of Iran's behavior. And that's, again, that's very problematic. I know the world is a complicated place, and we like simplistic explanations, but we have to look beyond it. That's, it's an arms control agreement. Just look at the arms control with technical details. All this other stuff has to be addressed. And on a normal day, it would be addressed. Militias fighting in various uh, spots all over the world, being involved in terrorist activity directly and indirectly. This is all stuff, again, contrary to global norms. So it's a big surprise from the politicians that they seem to be giving Iran a bit of a pass Behave yourself under the JCPOA, oh, and we'll overlook everything else. We can't. The situation on the ground is getting quite desperate, becoming very problematic. Iran is benefiting from it, but not in a nice way and not as a good neighbor. So action has to be taken. And the only final point I'll make is that if Iran is serious about its nuclear ambitions for civilian use only, then they have a single question to answer. The IAEA has over 20 different international treaties on the peaceful use of nuclear technology. Iran has not signed a one of them. These are about regional cooperation, these are about safety, these are about notification. If it's serious, it will sign up to these treaties. And these all have more monitoring regimes than everything else. But it hasn't signed up to it. So the signals all seem to be very clear. Iran is not looking to be a good neighbor, not looking to be a peaceful participant. They're looking to pursue their own agenda, which as Lincoln made quite clear, is not a very nice agenda. Thank you. Natalie? Uh, so thank you to YPFP and Trends for having me. Um, I actually do very much agree with most of what the ambassador and Dr. Butchel have said. Um, I think overall the Iran deal was a good deal, certainly points for improvement, um, but generally it brought a country into compliance uh, without firing a single shot, which is an, an enormous accomplishment, um, and certainly has, I think, opened up Iran to increased engagement with the international community um, that it didn't have the opportunity to before. Certainly there are human rights issues that need to be addressed, other things that were mentioned um, by both the ambassador and Dr. Birchall. But I, I believe that given time and the opportunity, 
um, for the deal to work. If there's not as much uncertainty surrounding the longevity of the deal, I think there's some difficulty with President Trump decertifying. That certainly sends a signal, regardless of whether that was actually tearing up the deal physically. Um, it sends a signal to the government in Iran. And if we're looking past you know, governments in the Middle East to countries like North Korea, who can say too, oh, well, you know, they had an agreement. And you know, speaking a bit to the, to the ambassador's point about, well, they had an agreement, and then the next president could rip it up or could do something. Um, so I think that there's certainly a, a lot of uncertainty that remains about whether the deal remains in place, how far things will go. Um, and I think explains some of the behavior that we see on the part of Iran to not fully come into compliance with other areas. Um, so I think as, uh, to continue to put faith in Iran is obviously quite difficult given their current track record. But I think given time that we will see improvements. And effort, good faith efforts need to be made on the part of both the United States and the international community to allow that to happen. Thank you. Russ. Well, first of all, thank you, YPFP, for hosting us and Sumaya for hosting. This is an illustrious panel. I'm very, very honored to be on it. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to give kind of a little bit of a different perspective coming from a journalist's point of view. Um, I covered the Iran deal. I continue to cover the Iran deal uh, and various other Middle Eastern security issues. And like any good journalist, I'm skeptical of everything. So when someone asks me my opinion on the Iran deal, I'm both intrigued and skeptical, no matter what. Um, I'd kind of like to do something a little unorthodox here really quickly. Uh, I have a quote that I'd like to read to you all, and it's, it's this. When we were negotiating with the Europeans in Tehran, we were still installing some of the equipment at the Isfahan site. That's one of the nuclear sites in Iran, for those who don't know. There was plenty of work to be done to complete the site and finish the work there. In reality, by creating a tame situation, we could finish Isfahan. Is there anyone in this crowd who knows who said that quote? No. That was Rouhani, circa 2005. I have another quote that I think is also very interesting. A constructive approach to diplomacy doesn't mean relinquishing one's rights. It means engaging with one's counterparts on the basis of equal footing and mutual respect. Does anyone know who said that? Also Rouhani. So those are two somewhat contrary statements. I think we can all agree. And I think that tells us a lot about who we're dealing with. Uh, Rouhani was seen as a moderate by many. I think the Obama administration clearly thought he was as well. I think what Rouhani's statements clearly say about him is that he is a very good political player in what is an extremely complex and aggressive political system in Iran, where someone who's moderate is not likely to usually win elections without playing well with those in the hardline group. So a lot of critics of the Iran deal wonder if they're going to cheat. I think that's one question that is constantly brought up are they going to cheat? Uh, the previous speakers have outlined some concerning cases in which perhaps they could. Uh, but I'm of the belief, just based on reading the deal myself a couple times over throughout the years and studying the country as a whole, Iran does not need to cheat this deal. Uh, there's actually really no reason that they would. Uh, there are sunset clauses for a lot of provisions, as I'm sure all of you are aware. Uh, and Iran has waited a long time to be the country that it is now. There's no reason not to believe that it will not wait to get what it eventually wants later on. Another point, too, that I think is very important to keep in mind here is that Iran needed this deal not because it wanted to have a nuclear program later on, but because Rouhani came in uh, on the premise that he would improve the economy. This was literally all he campaigned on. Nuclear issues were, of course, important, but Rouhani's focus was improving the economic situation for Iranians. That is one reason why I believe Iran has been so critical of the United States placing more sanctions on them, because that not only endangers Rouhani's position, but it also endangers the entire regime itself. Um, another thing that I think we should keep in mind, given those quotes as well, is thinking about the grand strategy of the Iran deal. One thing that I found very intriguing was the argument from the critics who said, we should incorporate ballistic missiles and terrorism, things of that nature, into this deal. Well, in any international agreement, you, it's impossible to incorporate everything. We all know that. What's fascinating about this deal, though, is that after a certain amount of time, I think it's approximately eight years from the signing, ballistic missile sanctions are off the table. They will be gone. They will be wiped out by the United Nations. Uh, that is deeply concerning to me, especially given the fact that 
there have been a significant increase in missile uh, testing since Iran signed the deal. I think that's something we need to keep our eye on. Now, the counterpoint to that from the Obama administration and others who were in support of this deal was, well, this is a stopgap, essentially. You know, we'll, we'll figure those things out later on. And that's a fair point. The issue that I have with that is that the United States historically, when it's come to Iranian policy, does not exhibit a lot of, uh, I think, history in doing things like that. Generally speaking, we take things out on a four to eight year cycle because that's the democratic system that we operate on. I, in my, in my opinion, I don't think we have actually done enough to kind of attack some of those other issues that we're now seeing. If you see what Iran has done since the signing of the deal as far as international relations are concerned, I think everyone should be concerned. Uh, we have a government in Baghdad right now which is extremely reliant on uh, Iranian militias. We have this, this Syria question, which is, of course, I don't need to tell you all that, how problematic that is going to be. We have Yemen, which is a nightmare as well. We need to keep in mind that the JCPOA is part of a grander strategy. And in my opinion, that is not being done. So whatever President Trump does do in the going forward, and the Congress, which, to be honest, I don't have a lot of faith in either, we do need to keep all these things in mind. Uh, if we don't have a grand strategy when it comes to Iran, we're going to have problems going forward. Thank you. Um, we're going to take some questions from the audience. If you have any question, please raise your hand. You can state your name and affiliation and your question. If you don't have any questions now, think about them. Um, I can present the first sort of discussion question. Um, so what I hear you saying, um, and I think we've heard that from a number of speakers, is that um, so even though Trump has decertified the deal, it doesn't mean that the US is no longer a party of it. Now it's up to Congress. And would I be correct in saying that you don't think Congress will revoke the deal? Congress is likely to stay on with the deal? Um, that's my first question. And then um, the second question is, um, you know, what are, you, what are some of your thoughts, you know, what happens if they do choose to revoke it? Is that sort of something that you think about? Yeah. Could I make a comment? And, and those are good questions. Those are the immediate questions that are in front of us. But um, these were excellent comments up and down the panel. They're at, they're at the surface. Yeah. The thing about the JCPOA that I think each of these comments points out is that um, it, it, it represents something important, but it's just the tip of a much bigger iceberg of strategic importance. I think that's what we're hearing. So let's just answer the question, A, I don't know what Congress will do. So this is a good time for all of you to try and drive the debate. I mean, this is a, it's an open season for good ideas. That's why we're here tonight. So I don't know what they will do. Secondly, if we were to pull out, the Europeans would be caught in the middle. They've signed 100 billion euro deals for Airbus and Total and these people. And by the way, just a comment, having been in government for some time, the Europeans depend on the Americans to be the hard one. If we're not the ones sort of leading the charge to impose sanctions and to be sort of the, the leader of the strategic uh, defense against bad things in the world, they're not going to get out in front of us. Although France was pretty tough at the negotiations at one point, tougher apparently than we were. But but, but generally, the Europeans are letting, they're, they're holding our coat and they're going to see what we do. They don't want to pull out of this deal because they want business with Iran. And European governments traditionally have a much lighter touch on business than American governments do on American business when it comes to sanctionable events. The, con the point I wanted to make, if I may just make a point, is that we talk about President Rouhani. I've done some, I've tried to dig deeper into who are we really dealing with here. And I'm going to say some things that may surprise you a little bit, which is that I don't think President Rouhani represents much of anything in, politically in Iran. It, I have a chart, and if you see me afterwards, I'll get it to you, that shows how many people filed to run for president of Iran in all of the elections since Bani Sadr was impeached in June of 1981. Uh, he was the only one that was, that was elected with almost 100% of the candidates could run. One was, was banned because he wouldn't accept Khomeini's constitution. Um, but that was 100%. Since then, it's been less than 4%. And in the last 20 years, less than 2% of the candidates who file are finally permitted to run. Rouhani was handpicked in 2013. He was handpicked in 27, 2016, although Raisi would have been uh, Khamenei's first choice because he was 56 years old, hardline cleric, part of the religious foundation establishment, which represents billions of dollars of property holdings. What, what I want to get across is that there's a series of seminal events in the history of this regime that add up to very weak ground under their feet at home. 
they did not inherit the revolution in 1979. The revolution led to a massive dem democratic outbreak for a year and a half that was finally suppressed by Khomeini because because thousands of people, tens, hundreds of thousands, turned out in the streets of eight cities. He shot his way to power. And so the revolution went underground. People fled the country. People were in jail. People were killed in the streets. But the student population sort of kept the flame burning. In, in 1999, look at the cover of The Economist. They thought the revolution came back. In 2009, the famous corrupt election when Nada bled to death on the street, that was, uh, that was a major event. What happened after that? The Arab Spring broke out in Tunisia, in Egypt, and then it hit Syria. It hit Syria in 2011, and when that <coughs> happened, the Iranians went to the mattresses because if they lost Damascus, and they said this, if we can't hold Damascus, we can't hold Tehran. So Rouhani said he was trying to improve the economy. He said that for domestic consumption. If I were advising President Trump, and I'm, I'm not, I would say, um, from now on, don't listen to anything that doesn't come out of the mouth of Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. He's the only power in that country. These other people are, are sort of puppets. I could name 10 authorities that Rex Tillerson has, because I had them when Colin Powell was my boss at Secretary at State. Not one of those powers is vested with Zarif. He's, he doesn't run the ambassadors in Iraq, Syria, <coughs> Yemen. He doesn't run arms transfers. He doesn't have a say over military deployments. He doesn't control security assistance funding. He's a mouthpiece. He's a charming mouthpiece uh, who does videos in English with, you know, with, with beautiful fountains in the background. Um, but he doesn't control anything. So why are we listening to him? He said a few weeks ago in Doha, uh, there's no military solution to the problems of the Middle East. A week later, the IRGC commander threatened to shoot ballistic missiles at every American troop within 2,000 kilometers in the Gulf. No military solution. They just fired on Riyadh. And now Hezbollah is sort of threatening uh, to move on, on northern Israel. So, um, so anyway, there's a lot to unpack here. Trends has actually published some of my analysis on what the regime fears most. But I would urge you to think, to keep peeling the onion. Go beyond Rouhani. Look under the surface. What are they really afraid of? Why do they do what they do? And you will find a regime that's scared of losing power at home. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Um, or sort of the need to really have a nuanced understanding of how politics works in Iran and, and how important is that for a U.S. administration? So I would certainly agree. I would just like to push back on one point. Um, you made the point about Yemen firing the missile at Riyadh and saying that that was an Iranian, you know, essentially alluding to the fact that it was an Iranian dictated move. And there hasn't been evidence to corroborate that. So it was Yes, a missile that Iran may have brought into Yemen, but wasn't something that was directed by the government in Iran. Or it hasn't uh, been confirmed. The latest I have is that it may not have been a full ballistic missile from Iran, but it wasn't a Scud, and it wasn't one of the sort of the old class missiles that were already in Yemen that Ali Abdullah Saleh, the former president, would have had, that the technology is now being examined by U.S. industry as we speak. Uh, but there were markings on the cases, and it's being looked at. But they, they don't believe that the Houthis had the ability to target 700-plus kilometers Certainly with not. any accuracy. And, and the technology, absolutely. I can, I can understand and get behind the point. But I would say that there's a distinction between having the technology in the country coming from Iran and having a dictation by the Iranian government to, have, to direct the Houthis to take that action. Yeah. If I could add to the ambassador's earlier point as well, um, I, I, would, I think uh, the comment on Zarif is, is a very poignant one, including uh, the Supreme Leader. Uh, the person who you really want to follow, if anybody, because this is the person who I follow when it comes to Iranian uh, international diplomacy, is Qasem Soleimani, right. the head of the Goods Force. Now, this man does run the foreign policy for Iran because he has said so. <laughs> he has made it very clear. Uh, there's actually a wonderful piece on him, uh, by, I think by the New Yorker, called The Shadow General, which I highly recommend all of you read. Uh, it is it's years ago when this was written, far ahead of its time. That's the person you need to keep an eye on. He has been seen everywhere from northern Iraq to Syria. He has essentially run roughshod anywhere he wants to go. I'm sure he's probably been to Yemen. I don't know for sure, but it wouldn't surprise me. He's, he's an interesting character, and I think he actually says a lot about what's actually going on in the Supreme Leader's version of international politics for Iran. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? 
Okay, think about those questions. Um, so I have a question sort of more on the, your point about strategy and about US strategy in general about Iran. So um, I think that when the Obama administration was trying to push forward the negotiations, they really tried it to separate the nuclear issue from the other issues that we were just talking about. So um, they said, well, this is just a conversation about Iran's nuclear uh, activities and programs, and, and, and they argued that this was the only way to make it happen. But then the other conversation that we're having right now is like sort of thinking beyond the nuclear agreement and thinking about U.S. engagement with Iran, especially when it comes to its role um, in, uh, say, Lebanon or Iraq or, or elsewhere. Um, and as Natalie pointed out, um, sort of Iran's foreign policy in the region is done in a very sort of, not, a, not in a very conventional way, so a lot of their outreaches to non-state actors, a lot of their outreach is sort of indirect. They have a lot of rhetorical support, but they also have some material support. And it's not easy to sort of point out or even verify incidents like that when the Houthis shoot a, a missile to, to Riyadh to say, well, you know, was it directed by the Iranians? Was it supported by the Iranians? And so you have a lot of conflicting opinions. So I guess my question is when we're thinking about broader U.S. strategy with Iran, and if it looks like we will have this agreement as it is for the next couple of years at least, um, how should we think about dealing with um, sort of that aspect of, of Iran's uh, foreign policy in general? Um, does it have to do with our engagement with other actors in the region? Or is it sort of a different approach? So I'm, I'm interested to hear what you think about that. Um, yeah. I'll give you a, a, my view, which is that, first of all, here in Washington, because of the nuclear deal and because of the prominence of Foreign Minister Zarif and President Rouhani and coming to the UN and, and, and being so prominent, giving interviews, we figured we're talking to the Iranians. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, actually, the Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, has been very busy for a long, long time. They're the, they're, they're the sort of lower classes. That's, they employ a lot of able-bodied men. Um, and they've been given a chunk of the economy since 2005. This was a concession of weakness from the Supreme Leader, who was not really as, uh, as religiously uh, followed as Khomeini after Khomeini's death in 2009. So uh, to compensate for his declining position, he, he handed an enormous part of the ec economy to the Revolutionary Guard, which is why you read about you know, um, certain projects uh, getting into trouble because the front companies are coming back to the Revolutionary Guards. Look, the Fifth Fleet in Bahrain has intercepted ship after ship after ship going to Yemen, filled with explosives, guns, cash, uh, missile parts, et cetera. This is not, you know, sort of a data point we're talking about. It's well known. In fact, there's a whole map of the ports of entry where the Revolutionary Guards does smuggling. If you read the State Department Trafficking in Persons report this summer, you know, most of the Middle East was tier two, which means they need to improve uh, the treatment of human beings. And, and, and uh, but, but Iran was tier three. They're actually swiping teenage boys off the streets of Afghanistan and, and smuggling them into Syria and putting a gun in their hand. So they're indentured sort of slave fighters under Soleimani's command. There are 18 Iranian bases in Syria. Uh, there are 70,000 men under arms on the Iranian payroll. 80,000 is the US military number in Syria. Um, two truckloads of 180, 150 kilograms of heroin were caught in Germany, driven by the Revolutionary Guards in January. And meanwhile, they're hanging people for minor drug offenses in Baluchistan. So, you know, you add these things up and you say, there's a whole subculture uh, around this regime that we're not seeing when we see it, we sort of shrug it off as being secondary to the JCPOA and the you know, relationship and the hope for the moderates against the, against the hardliners and the hope for detente, which, which President Obama's speech at the UN in 2013 clearly was an overture, hoping for better relations, and why not? But it, it was not responded to by, certainly by the Supreme Leader or the people around the Supreme Leader. We've had, we've had you know, a real deterioration of security throughout the Middle East, and a lot of people have been turned out of their homes. The, the Sunni cities of Iraq have been, they've been pushed out by these Iranian militias uh, in desperation. Um, the, a lot of men are missing. I mean, you should talk to the, Iraqi, the Sunni Iraqis. And then in Syria, as I say, 10 million people displaced, refugee camps in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, people flooding across to Europe, to Canada, uh, driving issues like Brexit and anti-immigration, which even helped President Trump get elected, let's be honest. So this all came from inaction in Syria. So it comes back to, if you're right, that this was just about nuclear, then why were we not able to push back on all of these egregious 
acts of terrorism, violence, destabilization, international law, violence, why didn't we do anything? So that's an interesting question. And on the margin of that question is that we did throw in a removal of the arms boycott. And Russia immediately had major arms deals to, to cash in as soon as the JCPOA was finalized. And within months, they were firing ballistic missiles. In 2010, there was a UN resolution that banned Iranian ballistic missiles banned. That was rescinded as part of the JCPOA, and the new language is they shall not. And as soon as John Kerry complained about their ballistic missile activity, Rouhani, no, Zarif and Dagan, the defense minister, immediately sort of laughed, laughed at him and said, sorry, pal, um, it's legal. And Mary Spice, this goes back to your first question about you know, what can Congress do now, and as everybody has said, this is, the JCPOA is just a tip of an iceberg or a much bigger piece. And just think that this is a great opportunity for Congress to debate all of these things. Congress is a big place, lots of divergent views. And so everybody just sort of, I mean, it was amazing. You look back five, six weeks ago, it seemed everybody had something to say about Iran. Everybody was ready for the decertification. Everybody's going to say something. And then we've been here for a week and a half, and nobody's saying a word of the Hill. It's just very strange. Um, so this stuff needs to be discussed and debated to find out what the US national security interests are. But tied to that, one of the biggest threats to U.S. national security is not just U.S. national security, it's regional security in the Middle East, it's essentially it's global security, is this role of non-state actors. You're absolutely right, Natalie. It'd be very difficult for us to find a line of command from the Iranian regime to the Houthi rebels. No problem. Hezbollah has openly admitted, yes, we're in Yemen training them with Iranian arms. Hezbollah openly admits, Iran openly says, Hezbollah is ours. What is Hezbollah? Hezbollah is a non-state actor. Technically, Hezbollah cannot have arms, cannot control territory. Only states have a monopoly over the use of violent force in international relations. And even then, they're not supposed to be using it. Right now, and Hezbollah is a designated terrorist organization in the United States, and there's been an upping of the sanctions in the last couple of months. All of this should be pointing, again, so the alarm bell should be just ringing like crazy, when you have reports coming out from the press, but not just from the press, I said it's Hezbollah themselves and Iran themselves often say this stuff. Yes, we're training in Lebanon. Yes, we're training in Syria. Yes, we're training in Yemen. You know, they're not hiding the fact. They're openly doing this stuff. So Hezbollah is a designated terrorist organization as an armed non-state actor that has been designated as a threat to the United States. This needs to be addressed. Now, obviously, by addressing this, you're going to upset the sponsor, the host, and which is Iran. But then how can Iran sit there, and this is same argument I have with our European colleagues, and say, no, 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 Hezbollah is fine. And we've had this discussion from European uh, parliamentarians. They provide good support and stability. So let's just leave them alone. It's like, oh, no, guys, these are nasty players. These are very dangerous characters. So this is part of the iceberg that can be looked at. The US has the designation in place. It has the identification as a security threat in place. Now here's a good opportunity to act upon them. As I keep saying, though, if this is different from the nuclear issue, but it seems from the technology transfer that Iran is continuing with, they're passing it on to Hezbollah. Hezbollah and the Revolutionary Guard quite often produce these maps, places we can blow up. You know, when you're sitting in Abu Dhabi and you get up in the morning and you open up one of these maps going, hey, that's where my flat is. Um, it gets a bit disconcerting after a while. You know, you start sort of wondering, you know, who's gonna press the button here? Because one of the biggest fears of groups like this we will always assume they're rational actors. It's just the habit we have as human beings. We assume everybody's a rational actor. Hopefully everybody is. However, the Iranian regime and Hezbollah have one ideology, God's law. It's God's understanding of all these things. So no international law, no basic understanding of civility and society. It is what God's authority tells us. Now we know it's manipulation of the guys involved and how they interpret it, but that's their justification. I don't see these as the most rational actors that can be trusted on a day-to-day -day basis. They may come around eventually, maybe, but they have a long way to go before we can do it. So here's an opportunity for Congress to bring all these ideas out and have a bigger discussion about them. Yeah. Um, do you have any comments? I wanted to sort of um, go back to a point that Natalie mentioned, um, and also uh, Richard also mentioned about how you know uh, keeping the JCPO JCPOA um, and the U.S. Um, staying with the agreement is a very critical sort of um, step just because if you do 
revoke the deal. It will ruin, you know, like you said, the main currency of international affairs, of diplomacy, of keeping that, you know, the diplomatic capability that the U.S. has and its credibility. So I think that's an important point that um, you've spoken about. And Natalie, you said that um, you've mentioned that um, sort of maybe this deal, or the nuclear deal, was a first step, not an, not an imperfect step, perhaps, but it was a great first step. You know, like I think there is, uh, you know, a lot of um, efforts coming in from different diplomats, whether in Europe or in the U.S., uh, to really get this agreement on board. But then, as you, men you mentioned, uh, there was a lot of uncertainty coming to it. So I think the question that I want to pose, um, and hopefully if the audience wants to jump in with any comments or questions, please feel free to just raise your hand. Um, if you want to just expand the conversation around um, the issue of nuclear non-proliferation and um, US diplomatic capability um, in, in, in bringing together this agreement and, and the future of such agreements with other countries, perhaps. So there were actually two quick points that I wanted to make on yeah. the on the prior question, and then we, oh, we can sorry. move on. No, not at all. Yeah. Um, the first was looking at non-state actors. I think the other data point that I would throw out there, certainly an abhorrent practice to continue to fund Hezbollah. They are certainly bad actors. But I would say, to contextualize a little bit, um, the relationships that Iran has with non-state actors are by necessity to a certain extent because of isolation in the region and in the international community. Um, so not supporting that in any way. But I would say that uh, there is a great amount of realpolitik that Iran practices when interacting both with the international community and regional neighbors um, that, that to me defines them as more of a rational actor. So I think perhaps the definition of that might be, might be different in certain cases. Um, and then the, the other quick point that I wanted to bring in on that as well in terms of looking more broadly at contextualizing um, Iran's actions is to look at the rest of the power dynamics in the region. So particularly when you're looking at Saudi Arabia and the actions that they've taken recently in regards to Lebanon. Um, I think Iran definitely feels uncertain in terms of its relationship there and feels the need to balance that power structure uh, within the region alongside this, uh, this feeling that they don't have certain allies and that there, is a lot of, um, there are a lot of threats to what, what they view to be their security uh, there. So. Yeah, I mean, that's, if you do put the real politic on it, this is what states will do. They will manipulate all tactical and strategic possibilities. I mean, that helps explain it, no question there, but it doesn't help justify it in any way, shape, or form. Um, as I said, any state that is making use of armed, armed non-state actors or designated terrorist organizations seems to be contrary to values, security, and the law system on it. So I understand the point. But it doesn't justify, the necessity doesn't justify the actions. And so it does make it quite difficult. But your key issue there about you know, keeping the deal in place and the US's credibility, yes, absolutely. Um, I look for a multi level, uh, multi level um, <clears throat> international institutional based global governance framework because it helps us all to get involved with it. But everybody has to play the game. And that's the most important part. So, I mean, you did make the point, Natalie, and I've heard this a number of times, that eventually Iran will come around. Now, I just remember as a kid, and I'm dating myself a bit here, when the embassy was taken over, oh, Iran will come around. People were saying it back then, um, that Iran will come around. And there's been no evidence of it yet coming around. So I'm not sure how long we're going to wait for this or what we can continue to do to keep overlooking some of the issues. But you know, we'll see what happens. If I may, I could probably sh shed a little bit of the light on um, the original question regarding what Congress can do. Uh, honestly, w to your point, uh, Dr. Virtual, why have we not seen them say anything? Well, they've been preoccupied, well, clearly, <laughs> as, we, as we all know. Uh, very preoccupied with some certain things. And I think, uh, I, I have to say, uh, just knowing my experience covering a little bit of the Hill, this, in my opinion, in the near future, will not be something that even the Republicans, who are generally skeptical of the deal, will likely be willing to debate in, in any great fervor because of the fact that you do not gain a lot by debating and pushing for international policy as a congressman or senator. Uh, in fact, it's often complicated and it often distracts from other things you could be doing for your voting bloc. It's extremely difficult to get Congress to talk about foreign policy. Uh, even Senator Corker, whose uh, hearings I covered during the deal, was extremely uh, willing to engage in these conversations. But even as the head of, of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, you know, you had guys coming in and out in the committee. You had uh, very few people who were actually engaging in 
what I thought was nuanced debate. Uh, it was very much Democrats, Republicans, with a few people you know, in the middle who, who hadn't quite made up their minds, a few who switched sides. But for the most part, it came down to party lines. Uh, based on that history, I'm, I'm not very confident that this is worth it to them to bring up in the near future uh, until, of course, Iran does something that would warrant that. So if I wanted to just throw out a specific recommendation to Congress, um, it would be instead of what they did before, which is to say presidents should certify every, what, 60, 90 days that they're in compliance, change that and say we should have a, a full intelligence assessment backed on any sites of concern that our experts believe need to be looked at or inspected, and also a report from the State Department on whether they are satisfied that IAEA has, has gone through all of its protocols to the limits of its of its powers um, and is satisfied that they haven't found anything of concern. In other words, change the formula a little bit, get some names of sites inside Iran that have come up since the JCPOA that where they think there may be secret research going on. Go back to uh, the Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz, an MIT physicist. I have to say, I've never come across anyone since Ernie Moniz who I think has who has more credibility in physics than he does. So I'm just going to, he's, I, I, I have to vouch for, for him. I'm happy to do that. But what he said was, wherever fissile material is moved, it will leave a fingerprint for years and years that they can't hide and can't erase. But not everything about mounting a warhead on a missile is fissile. It's blueprints. It's, it's, it's mechanics. It's wiring diagrams, it's miniaturization, it's electronics, and it doesn't leave a fingerprint. And that's what, that's what Congress should do, in my opinion. They should, they should sort of change the terms and say, all right, forget the certification, which is just a little bit of a, a cop-out that says, Mr. President, you worry about it and just tell us everything's all right, and then if anything's wrong, it's on you. That's, that's what that was. Now change it around and say, all right, let's all get serious. We have some areas of concern. We're not going to tear the deal up, but we're going to, we're going to be serious about the deal. And I think, who wouldn't want to be serious about the deal? I don't think the Iranians wanted to nuke Israel. I, I mean, it would be the last thing they ever did as a regime. Uh, they would provoke a, you know, a terrible outcome. I, and, and they knew they were going to get hit. So they, both sides had an incentive to walk back from the brink. And what Iran got for it was an awful lot. I started off by saying it, so I won't repeat it. But I think legitimacy, face, uh, a, a better show for the regime with their own people at home. And I, let me just say that the 80 million Iranian people are not the enemy. They're actually, I think, in a pretty tough spot. They've been under a, a bad regime for a long time, and I think they'd welcome a change. Thank you. Yes, yes please go ahead. Uh, Caroline Williams from uh, CEP and Gartner. I was actually wondering if the panelists could elaborate on what decertification actually means in terms of legal consequences and how that we could use Wonderful. We'll take three questions at a time. I saw a hand in the back. Yes, sir. Hi, Robert Thomas. I'm an Asia Pacific fellow with YPFP. <coughs> Several of you on the panel have had comments about how the United States might approach uh, the many problems we still have with Iran under the current conditions with the deal in place and comments about the problems that would come into play if the administration unilaterally withdraws without an action of Congress. If in a month or a year the United States Congress were to make the decision to withdraw from this deal, what would the outline of a path forward for the United States be, strategically speaking? That's a good question. Yes, at the back, sir. Hello, Maurizio Geri from Italy. <coughs> Excuse me, my voice is the cold. I work for Old Dominion University. Uh, the question is uh, <coughs> how much the Al Saud family and Bin Salman uh, can escalate the Cold War uh, against Iran. Uh, we saw, as you said, Lebanon, Qatar, etc., after obviously Yemen, Iraq, and Syria, until the U.S. Congress uh, asked the ally to uh, reduce the actions. Thank you. So we had three questions. The legal meaning of decertification, uh, strategic uh, path forward um, for uh, U.S. strategy, and then the question about Cold War and politics between Saudi and Iran. Feel free to pick any question you'd like to tackle. Oh. <laughs> the first one's technical. Does anyone know whether it automatically triggers a pullout or whether Congress then has to figure out what to do? 
I'm not touching that one. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll have the answer. Okay. Um, I think from what I understood um, in terms of the technical sort of process, um, once uh, the president, so I believe it's uh, the president has to uh, make a decision every 90 to 120 days uh, to say, whether Iran is following the terms of the agreement and whether the agreement is within U.S. national security interests. And Trump has done that. He has certified those two conditions um, two times prior to October. Um, now that um, the president has decertified the deal, meaning that he's saying, well, it's not meeting the terms of the agreement or it's not within U.S. national security interest, now a process will begin by Congress reviewing the agreement again um, and making a decision whether or not um, Basically, I believe it's the first step would be sanctions, um, whether the U.S. will, um, you know, bring back the sanctions that it had lifted earlier um, when, when the negotiations were happening. So, um, so basically, uh, the president throws the ball in uh, the court of Congress, and Congress is sort of left with this very difficult dilemma of deciding whether or not um, the sanctions will be back or not. And so that's kind of what it means to a certain extent. Yeah, the point. president, I don't think, did not say... They're violating the agreement. What he yeah. said was, I don't have confidence enough to say that they're complying. Mm -hmm. You take a look. And so that's slightly different. And it gives Congress the ability to say, well, we've concluded that they are violating. Or, as I suggest, uh, saying these are, our, these are the questions we're having trouble answering. These are the sites that we'd like to have a better look at. And, 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 use the, and then sort of have the Europeans be part of that conversation. They won't like it. But if it's about specific sites and some intelligence data that suggests that there's activity of that's suspicious that should be investigated, um, you know, why not? Why wouldn't we do that? Um, so, Richard, do you want to add something? I mean, the decertification is U.S. law. It's not the JCPOA. Yeah. Right. So it's a congressional piece of legislation that says if Iran doesn't do three things or if it's contrary to the national interest and the president makes a public declaration and then Congress gives a side. Congress wanted this. Congress won the ability to get involved with it. And then once it, that's the unclear part is once it gets to Congress, their options are pulling out, renegotiating, coming up with something new. So it's interesting how it's presented in the press sometimes, how decertification is the US has said the JCPOA is out the door. No, it's just domestic legislation. The JCPOA carries on regardless. So arguably, it's very clever because we haven't pulled out. The Europeans have no cause for concern. Congress needs to get serious about the non-proliferation piece. The third question, though, was quite interesting, which yes. is what can the Al Saud family do to turn up the heat or to, to manage the Cold War? Uh, you know, Richard lives in Abu Dhabi, uh, has a good perspective on this. My own view is that the first question is what can the United States government do, because that's my perspective. What would I do if I were at the NSC trying to build a strategy to put some pressure on Iran that didn't violate our undertakings under the JCPOA, but that, that answered some of these, these egregious uh, security threats and, and abuses of international law and norms, as Richard laid out. Uh, so uh, there are certain things we can do, but my view is that a lot of what, of what makes Iran weak and dangerous um, is very hard for the Americans to address because it has to do with the lack of legitimacy, religious legitimacy, of uh, the supreme leader in the Shia world. The Hezbollah is 100% on their payroll, so I guess their vote doesn't count much, but I can't find any Shia clerics in Iraq, for example, who follow the supreme leader of Iran. You know, Sistani absolutely is against uh, Ayatollah Khamenei's. And by the way, look at the constitution that Khomeini forced down their throats in 1980. 81. Look at that constitution. Veliat ifaki is a phrase most people, if you haven't heard it, it sounds strange. But that's the key phrase. Everyone in the Middle East knows this phrase. What it says is that the 12th descendant of the prophet is in occultation, and until he appears again, the supreme leader is the embodiment of the, the prophet. And that's powerful. In other words, it, it, it overtakes judicial authority, military authority, government authority, legal authority, Anything the Supreme Leader says goes. And, and it's the first time in hundreds of years that, that religious devotion has been sort of strapped onto temporal power. And it's, and it's a highly dangerous thing. ISIS tried to do it in Raqqa, same thing. We'll have a caliphate. What we say goes. We have our own religious law. You saw how dangerous that was. But, but Iran wrote the book on that. And, and they opened the Pandora's box. So I think our religious friends in the Middle East can advise us on how to, how to sort of poke that, that weakness, uh, because it's pretty hard for Americans to do that. If I could address the, uh, the second 
question. Um, what would uh, the strategy look like if Congress were to decertify? Well, I mean, if we were to paint that picture, first of all, you're, you're as was previously mentioned, you're putting the Europeans in a very uh, difficult position. That being said, there were some who were already skeptical from the beginning, the French, uh, as was noted previously as well. But more importantly, uh, you have to and now, as the major player who is no longer going with the JCPOA or the P5 plus one, now the US would have to take an assertive role. Now Congress would literally have to make this a front issue on their agenda. And depending on how much confidence you have in them and their ability to do that, that's a very interesting question. You know, what does that look like? Are we gonna actually give Congress this kind of unprecedented diplomatic power that we've really, in our history, haven't done for quite a long time? So I think that's one thing we have to keep in mind here going forward. Even if it was decertified, if Congress were to do that, do they want to shoulder that burden? I think it would be a big step for Congress or even the president to pull out completely. As was said earlier, the current um, presidential regime has either said, I don't like these deals or I'm pulling out of these deals, even though he hasn't technically pulled out of any of them yet. So the Paris Climate Change Agreement, got another three years. TPP has not been formally revoked. NAFTA has not been formally revoked. So again, he says one thing and then... They haven't pulled out of them yet, but it is impacting credibility and leadership. I mean, this is an international system the U.S. and its allies created. So you don't start saying, oh, we hate this system, we don't like it. Um, and it is about leadership issues. So, I mean, I think, and I think Congress would have a lot of good feedback on this, saying, look, this is going to make us look bad. <clears throat> but equally, as I said earlier, it's going to take away a very strong tool of continual scrutiny on Iran. So you're actually, I find it personally, I find it counterproductive because I don't think we'd see a really strong regime coming in place. But certainly the U.S. cannot send their own inspectors in. Certainly the U.S., I hope, doesn't intend on sending a military force in to remove everybody and everything. So I mean, all the scenarios don't look that great. Whereas if we keep the agreement in place, we can continue to ask questions, continue to scrutinize, continue to maintain it. Now we do have to strengthen some of the issues, the sunset clauses. That needs to be looked at. The expansion of or the accountability of the IAEA needs to be looked at. And Congress can do that. Congress can demand that the IAEA does provide further information. IAEA can just say no, but it creates another little interesting diplomatic battle and political battle to be great to see in the public forum. So the U.S. has a lot of credibility across a range of issues. You know, and as was said earlier, if I pull out of this deal, then everybody else can say, hey, we all get a free ride. You know, it comes back to... Why did they come to the table? And I've always been suspicious of that question. I've given you my theory on that. At one point, I asked a senior NSC person at a private event, um, why, did they want nu why did they want nuclear establishment? Why do they want nuclear technology? They said, well, energy. But the former, the guy that I mentioned before, the former deputy director of IEEA, the Finnish uh, diplomat, Ali Heinen, when he was at IEEA, he looked up the natural reserves of uranium in Iran and uh, found that there was enough there to run the Boucher reactor for five years. And that was it. That's the entirety of their national reserve of uranium. So who thought that that was a good idea? And by the way, there was an MIT scientist years ago who did a, a big study that showed that as, as sort of the cost of energy of different options, oil and gas it was such a natural for Iran, and maybe other things, geothermal, solar in some places, renewables, but nuclear was a very high cost option. And I don't think that the White House or the administration ever asked that question, or, or, ever, or ever, if I could put it this way, unpacked the, the notion that maybe Iran needed it for a different reason. And one, one study that uh, Trends published in both English and Arabic, uh, which I co-authored with an Iranian scholar, uh, posited from writings of the regime that the reason that Khamenei pushed the nuclear program starting in the 1990s was the lack of religious charisma. It was he saw that he couldn't carry forward the, the bright flame that Khomeini had, which he clearly did in the region. He was, he was a, a seminal historical figure, controversial, but, but people followed Khomeini. They didn't follow Khamenei. And so he, he took these moves, including you know, having a nuclear capability, a little bit like Saddam Hussein, who had his own cabinet convinced that he had nukes. That's why the intelligence was wrong, because even his ministers thought he had them. What if he didn't? Maybe he'd be dead the next day. So it was sort of a... It was a way of having some kind of higher card than anybody else. And, and as I said, he gave away a huge part of the religious foundations 
hold over holding companies and banking and you know sole source contracting and whatnot to the Revolutionary Guards in 2005, another major sign of weakness in the regime. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to look at why they do the, what they do. But that is an interesting point, because, I mean, Iran, even before the revolution, had some, had some of the largest known oil reserves and was one of the largest exporters, over 9 million barrels a day type stuff. So they had oil, they had energy supplies, and they also share one of the largest natural gas, gas fields. And gas fields are like nuclear, they're green energy. So why do you need a nuclear? Good question. I haven't thought about that one. Neither did the White House. <laughs> <laughs> Just another quick point to finish that up. I think uh, something else to look at, and I don't necessarily have the answer for this, um, but to, to Rob's question about looking if we're pulling out unilaterally and what does that mean, not necessarily what the U.S. does going forward, but I think points to take into consideration too are what does that look like for Russia and China. Um, I don't think you see outsized influence by China coming in and, and taking over the U.S. role, certainly, but they do have deals to completely redesign and rebuild uh, the heavy water reactor at Iraq. Um, they, they have vested, and, and, and Russia as well. I mean, there are certainly vested economic interests that, that coincide with the nuclear program, and I think it's a question that the Congress will need to ask um, before they make that kind of move. That's true. I think they will get major deals, and they will keep them. Thank you. We have a question at the very back. Yes. Um, so first, I just want to make a few comments because I know you said earlier about that. And uh, just a point of clarification, uh, Ambassador, you, know, you said that Khomeini died in 2009. It's actually 1989, so it's about a difference of 20 some years. So it, it wasn't that he was even around in 2009 to be making any types of decisions. So I think it's very. I just want to say it's very problematic to make these grand oversimplifications and, and refusing to understand the complexities and nuances, it's incredibly dangerous rhetoric, first of all. And claiming that Iran is not a rational actor and that everything's God's law is an incre incredibly large oversimplification of the situation. Um, if Iran was not a rational actor, I'm sure there would have been uh, m many more situations in the Middle East that would have already happened. And for, for you guys to to claim this, I, I would just say is a bit of a oversimplification of the complexities in the region, especially in Europe. But to get to my question, uh, why would the international community ever make a deal with the United States again, given time and time again it's gone against its own word and now pulling out of several other agreements? And also, the EU was completely against Trump's decertification. Uh, Ambassador Mogherini, she uh, made comments uh, in the news regarding this and how she came out and said that the EU does not support the U.S. Uh, trying to re re decertify the JCPOA, uh, and and how, what do you guys think this will do for the relationship between the United States and the rest of the P5 plus one? And to go to your point, you mentioned about Russia and China. Well, actually, many many uh, United States um, officials themselves, Russia and China, and our other allies in Europe, as well as even Israeli uh, officials, are all in support of the, the deal itself. So it seems. To me, that the, the people who are against the deal are the same people who are were the ones supporting the war with Iraq. Are you guys suggesting that the best way forward would be to have a war in the Middle East again? Thank you. Do you want me to? No. Whoever wants to take yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, no, I would never say I support a war at all. Um, I didn't support the war in Iraq, and I certainly don't support a war in Iran. You point on rational actors. I mean, as Nelly made the point, we have variations of what a rational actor may or may not be. As I said, I hope all leaders around the world are rational actors. North Korea, one of the biggest concerns is, is this guy an irrational actor? <clears throat> Everything points towards a, yes, he's very irrational. No, they're saying he is a rational actor. <clears throat> Iran is a state. It is looking to its own survival. It is, by definition, has the characteristics of a rational actor. But all irrational actors always look like rational actors, and we can have this philosophical debate all night long. What I'm saying is that they have a constitutional system that declares openly and publicly that the only authority, as Lincoln pointed out, is God and their understanding of religion. Now that's problematic from an international law point of view because you go and say, no, we have a treaty. Yeah, but is your treaty in compliance with our understanding of the religious tenets? When the sanctions fell, one of the biggest delays in getting businesses back into Iran was the new oil deal what was going to be the partnership between outside companies and Iranian companies to start drilling at the oil. Everybody kept saying a deal's been signed, but no deals were signed. They were MOUs. Because Parliament passed a version of this law, but yet the religious authority would not approve the law. 
and the religious authority under the Supreme Leader, as appointed by the Constitution, has to approve the law. And there was a nine month delay in this because it wasn't religious enough. Now, they didn't come out and say it wasn't religious enough. They said it didn't comply with the Constitution. And the Constitution says that everything in the ground belongs by dictate to the Iranian people. So there was a debate within it. So yes, in many ways, you could say it is an sim oversimplification. But it's also a very key point to the entire political system of a region where the supreme leader picks who goes to parliament, picks who the leadership is, picks who the negotiating position is. And I hope this person does have a sensible brain. And we can see so far, possibly they do. But it's still a concern. They're not somebody who has declared they buy into the international system that they adhere to, or they at least pretend to adhere to the normative system. You're right, not every state in the world does follow international law. Well known. But they'll come up with excuses as to why not. And they'll at least pretend to be part of the system. So it is an interesting thing to look at, but equally I would strongly reinforce that we do need to look at the nature of the Constitution and how authority is portrayed in the country because that tells us a lot about how they may act in the future. Um, perhaps just to sort of follow up on the discussion that we're having, I think it's absolutely important to bring in complexity and nuance uh, to any discussion about any Middle Eastern sort of issue. Um, and we see that a lot happening. And I think one sort of useful thing to keep in mind is that, you know, in the same way that the United States is not a black box, there's different actors who have different interests. Iran, Saudi Arabia, any other country in the Middle East is also not a black box. So you can't really generalize the behaviors of one actor within that country to sort of generalize on the entire uh, uh, region. So I think, as you've mentioned, you know, it's really important to have people in, um, you know, whether they're US diplomats or people in think tanks who have a really deep historical understanding of how uh, Middle Eastern, each you know, di different Middle Eastern country works and, um, and sort of really not having that black box um, image in their head. Because um, um, as we've sort of discussed, um, it can really lead to sort of different uh, generalizations that may not be as nuanced. But um, I think that's definitely uh, something to keep in mind. Um, and, and really, and, and you've mentioned, Ambassador, the point about the domestic incentives that Iran had early on about what, why did they want to develop a nuclear, a nuclear program to begin with. Um, and sort of taking all these factors into consideration is definitely an important, important aspect to keep, keep in mind uh, when we're having this debate. You know, I would just make a comment that one way, it's, it's really important to look at area studies and focus on the culture and the history of a, of a certain country. And, and Persia has its own very incredible, rich history. But at the same time, if you are interested in political development as a historical sort of subject, I find that there is a 21st century phenomenon, which I think the young professionals, you know, could, could take an interest in over time, of what kind of governments come to power. What, what, are the, what are the real terms of legitimacy and justice that underlie governance in, in, in the 21st century? There's a lot of talk about good governance and, 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 and that you hear about. But I actually find it interesting to look at Russia, China, Iran, Syria, North Korea, maybe a couple of others, and, and look at regimes who never want to leave power. It's the same people for in perpetuity. I mean, Xi Jinping just did the 19th Party Congress no successor on the, on the standing committee. So he's going to be around for a while. Vladimir Putin has been playing hopscotch with the prime minister's chair to stay in indefinitely, right? Um, Iran, 38 years and counting, the same regime. Uh, of course, the Assad family and, and the Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-il, Kim Il-sung uh, dynasty. So, so there's some similarities there. And I would just commend those to you. And then you ask yourself, well, how did they stay in power? Did they do it uh, you know, with rose petals coming from the population, saying, please you know, continue what you're doing? And I would just say to anyone who has questions about the challenge that we're posing to the Iranian regime is you know, go tell that to the 3,100 people who've been hung under Rouhani since he took power. And by the way, you know, he promised to release the Green Movement leaders, Mousavi, et cetera, Karubi. They're still under house arrest. They were supposed to be out within a year. They're still in jail. Um, and you know, his justice minister, poor Mohammadi, this is the moderate Rouhani in, in 2013, w was a guy who personally signed off on 30,000 executions in August and September of 1988, a, a war crime of, you know, the biggest killing of political prisoners since the Bataan Death March. And it's just coming to light. And there are letters before the Secretary General calling for a full investigation uh, of, this, of this war crime. That was his justice minister. His defense minister, Dagan, was the man who first went to the Bekaa Valley in 
1981 to and started training uh, Shia from the south, which became the Hezbollah fighting force. He ran the operation that blew up the 241 Marines. I was the desk officer for Lebanon in the Pentagon when the Marines were hit. James Mattis was a young Marine, and those were 241 of his comrades. So how do you think he feels knowing that Rouhani's first defense minister was the guy that blew up his, his you know, fellow Marines uh, that many years ago? Okay, ancient history, but this is, we're talking 2013 to 2017. So I would just say um, maybe that's overgeneralizing, but I just think that actually the details are what, what brings you the wisdom. If I could add uh, some idea to your point there. Nuance is obviously important, especially when it comes to Iran and the Middle East as a whole. I think anybody here knows that. But I think what's really interesting is on the same hand, people who make that argument often make the binary argument of war versus no war, or war or this deal. That is extremely dangerous thinking, in my opinion. Uh, there is usually alternatives to any given situation in diplomacy. We've seen this in history more times than we can count. So I think it's very, we have to be very careful about, on the one hand, acknowledging the eccentricities and nuances while also putting ourselves in a binary decision on what we do going forward. That's the first point. Second of all, on the, uh, the critique of irrational versus rational actors. This was probably one of my least favorite things in grad school that, that I ever had to deal with, and I'm sure for a lot of you it is too, because it's an ongoing debate that no one's ever really solved. But irrational actors, if they do exist, can act rationally, and the vice versa is equally true. Now, if you look at some of what Iran has done since the deal, I think it's been extremely rational. The agreements with Russia, the, the, the new agreements they're trying to make with the Chinese, uh, Ghassim Soleimani you know, essentially putting himself in charge of the PMUs as a shadow general, these are all extremely rational decisions based on an agreement that they made. So whether they're irrational or rational, I'm not going to say. But I'm gonna, I, I do think it's important that we keep nuance as a holistic perspective. Thank you. We have time for one or more two questions. Yes. yes. My name is Leticia, and I have a question about two points that have been brought up by all four members of the panel. You've spoken about having um, executive power credibility with making executive agreements with countries, and you've also spoken about the notion of rational versus irrational actors. I'm not going to delve into that debate because, frankly, we don't have time. But I would like to I would like to ask if if the notion of rationality between actors is also what's it was also what is supposed to lend credibility to executive agreement, maybe the belief that this person will hold on to their word or that credibility would also let executives or other um, nation states hold uh, other nation states accountable for other actions such as military action in Syria or some of the actions going on internally, then um, how would you explain, how would, if a state believes that a leader is not behaving rationally, then behave themselves. And the reason I'm asking this question is because I'm taking from the, what you've been asking, what is the benefit of nuclear armament? Why would someone like to continue this sort of thinking? But what comes to my mind is, if I believe I'm dealing with a series of irrational actors, or maybe individuals whose patterns I cannot fully understand, and one of them happens to be one of the world's largest, if not the largest superpower, then is it not in my best interest to keep an armament in hand for, the, for at least the sheer purpose of saying, if you try, here are all of your targets that I can hit, because as of now, I don't trust that you will behave rationally as has been shown by your previous actions. My IR theory, my IR theory professors would love that question. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, I think we have one more question. Yes, go ahead. Um, so kind of what you were talking about earlier with um, the history between how that's so important to know the history and stuff. Um, what do you guys think, um, how do you guys think that Saudi Arabia and kind of their actions recently um, and kind of how tense the Middle East is right now with Yemen and, and um, you know, Saudi Arabia and to me it has seemed that um, President Trump visiting Saudi Arabia and kind of having this relationship with them already right off the bat has maybe given a sign to Iran that maybe Saudi Arabia is more cozy with 
the president of the U.S. than Iran can be. So what do you guys think um, Saudi Arabia's position, how is that going to influence Iran and looking to, towards the future and whether or not they're going to acquire nuclear weapons? That's actually a, a good question around, you know, are we seeing a nuclear arms race? Is it, are we, is it accelerating? Is it slowing down? Maybe that's something we might be able to know. In 2008, I was on a business trip uh, where we picked up a former Secretary of Defense along the way who had just come from the Bahrain Security Conference, at which Prince Mukrin of Saudi Arabia, who was the intelligence chief, stood up and spilt for all of the Arabs to Iran, basically said, we will not allow Iran to have anything we don't have. And they announced the beginning of civil nuclear power on the Arabian Peninsula. UAE then said they were going to do it. Saudi was going to do it. We had a meeting with, and this was not government, so I can tell the story, with uh, Crown Prince Sultan before he died. And uh, he said, yes, it's a hedge. He basically described it as a hedge. Yeah, we have civil power. I mean, they have oil. But if we need to do something further, we have the technology uh, to convert in case we are challenged with nuclear weapons. So what I'm saying is I think that, the, I think that the, the tinder was pretty dry and that the conditions were moving in the wrong direction toward what appeared to be a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. And the fact that Israel has an undeclared capability has always been a bone of contention for Egypt and others. Um, very hard for Americans to manage. It's one thing to do dealings with the Soviet Union, good conversation about rational actors, you know, they, we were doing all kinds of nasty things to each other, threatening annihilation, uh, you know, 3,000 missiles over the North Pole. It would be the end of life as we knew it, particularly in this town. But, but we still considered them rational, and we were able to negotiate our way out of it because we both wanted to survive. The question is, what, do you, how, what would you say about Iran, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, with the wild card of Israel, uh, that Iran is aiming at sort of both as separate enemies, um, that's a pretty unstable situation. And, you know, who are, are we going to comfort ourselves by saying, well, I think all of them are rational actors. I mean, it's, it's at that point, you just have to make sure that you try to defuse it. And so I am going to give President Obama credit for walking it back from the brink. That happened. And now other things are possible, uh, including detente, including Iran uh, improving its, its act. Uh, nobody wants a war. People have done studies on that and shown that a war might be too hard to control. It could be, it could be really grinding for the West as well as for Iran, even though we feel we have superior capabilities. So there is no appetite for war. I think there is a question, though, about accountability and having the Americans at some point in time, I'm not being political here, sort of reminding themselves, as Richard, who uh, knows a lot about international law, of, of the principles that should underlie American foreign policy. We need a principled foreign policy. We need to be against torture, detention, murder, barrel bombing cities, uh, driving able-bodied men out of their homes, uh, and, and, and you know, ethnic cleansing, if you will, in Iraq. That may be too strong, but maybe not, uh, depending on who you talk to. So there's a lot of uh, shooting missiles you know, into, into, the, the cap, into the capital of Saudi Arabia is an act of war. And so who's doing what to whom? I think you know, the Saudis, uh, I think the President Trump sent an unambiguous symbol right away. He said he went to Riyadh, 55 Arab leaders were there. He said, you know, there's no tilt to Iran. How, how much clearer could he be? These are allies of ours. Are they perfect? Are we perfect? You know, that's a different discussion. But we have had alliances with these countries for a long, long time. And there have been threats from Iran for a long, long time. The window's been open for Iran to improve its relationship with the West, and, and it's still open, frankly, for them. They have a lot of opportunity, but uh, they haven't taken it yet. So in line with that point, I think um, when you're talking about, you know, how do I trust, what are, what are ways that, um, in terms of executive action and what we can look at for rational versus irrational actors, another point is, you know, further economic engagement, which is something that the JCPOA opens up Iran to do. Um, intent certainly behind a lot of this is to bring them into the international community as we've talked about with the EU particularly. And I think if you have some of these confidence building measures, you're able to better assess what the thought process is behind some of those rational actors who may have irrational, take irrational action or have irrational thoughts, or the irrational actors who sometimes have rational thoughts. I mean, I, I think uh, bringing them in in a, in a broader context 
um, helps to desecuritize a lot of the conversation that we're having that is so strictly securitized. Um, it needs to be looked at, uh, as I say, in a broader context. Wonderful. Um, I want to thank you all for uh, engaging in this very, very important and critical discussion. Um, I hope you all um, have some more questions to think about in the future. Um, and join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.